We got this bug report. It said, I never get the notifications when we run out of stuff. And it went on to explain that they were warned when they were running low on something, so they knew to make plans to replenish, but then when they tried to use the resource, sometimes they'd already be out. The context here is a game. It's an online, multiplayer, zombie apocalypse, role-playing game, and running out of stuff is problematic. Almost every decision that you make in this game has to do, depends on what you have and what you need. And the notifications get triggered on various events, for example, when zombies are spotted or when people join or leave tribes, and of course, anything to do with gaining or losing resources. So the notification in question is resource depleted. And the cause of the bug was that for all of our notifications, we had a text version of the notification that went to some notification channels and an HTML version of the notification that goes to other notification channels. And they were defined separately. And they were out of sync. So as you might have guessed, this is a copy-paste error. We copied the resource scarce notification to create resource depleted, updated the text version, and forgot to edit the HTML version. You know, you might be thinking, shouldn't the tests have caught this? Um, and the truth is, yes, they should have. And they probably would have if we had written any. <laughs> so yeah, the notify package is kind of gross, and also there are no tests. Now, we were actually OK with this. Right? When we first implemented the notifications, there weren't, they weren't all that important. We didn't have very many of them. They were straightforward. We had only one notification channel. Over time, they started becoming more and more central to the mechanics of the game, and we implemented more of them, and they became a lot more complex. So this bug report served as a signal to the team that it was time to get this part of the code base under control. What we really wanted was for it not to be possible for the plain text version and the HTML version to get out of sync. And the first step was to add tests. Now here's what's tricky. The functions in the notify package call functions on our comms package, which in turn talk to a third party pub sub service. And that means that our tests would have to be making calls over the network to a service that we don't control and which would fail in unexpected ways. And it's not great for testing. Now, there might be a way to add some configuration to the comms package to let us bypass the pub sub service. But if we're not publishing the messages to uh, the pub sub service, we'd have to publish them to somewhere else so that we could actually check them. There was, there was no way to get in between there. And the thing is, we're not trying to test the comms package. We're trying to test the notify package. Like, we don't care about all of this complexity. We, all of these functions are completely incidental to our purpose. What we want to know is, did the message say the right thing? And did the right people get the message? And it turns out there's a very careful dance that you can do to make it utterly trivial to test the feature. And with this maneuver, you'll never be more than 30 seconds away from a production deploy at all times throughout the entire process. And the process is called the no-op, no-op, no-op interface maneuver. I'm using the term no-op here loosely to mean changes that don't actually change anything. Now, on the surface, that might seem pointless, but it's doing nothing with a purpose. So what the no-op, no-op, no-op interface maneuver lets us do is move things around in tiny increments until we can tell the notification functions who to talk to for all of their communication needs. And then in production, we'll use a real transmitter. And in test, we can pass in fake transmitters that just keep track of what happens and don't talk to pub sub services or write to the database or do anything asynchronously that we would have to jump through hoops to test. Now, almost every single step in this maneuver is safe. In this context, safe has a very precise and technical definition, a safe step is one change where the code will work both before and after the edit. Right? When you have tests, this is fantastic. It means you can make a single edit, run the tests. If they fail, you back them out with one undo. When you don't have tests, it's even more important that each step is small and demonstrably safe. Because if the path between one working 
a state and another is 20 or 50 or 100 steps, then you are virtually guaranteed to get it wrong. And there won't be any test to tell you what broke. And now you're relying on your customers to tell you what broke. It's not pretty. So there's one step in the no-op, no-op, no-op interface uh, maneuver that's not safe. There's a moment where the code won't work, but it's very brief, and you can lean on the compiler to fix it. So for our purposes, it's safe enough. All right, here we go. Three no-ops and an interface. So the very first thing that you're going to do is not change any existing code. And this is important. All the existing code works, and working code pays the bills. So here are the existing comms functions, which you're not going to change yet. Basically, the notify package assembles strings and figures out who the recipients are and then uses these three functions to transmit the notifications to the right people in various ways. Now, since these are package functions, it's really hard to fake them out in a useful way. And what we need is a type that we can pass around that does these three things. So let's make one in the comms package to find a new type. We're going to call it signal. It kind of doesn't matter what type it is because it's not going to have any data or values um, or fields. It's just a placeholder. It's a hook where we can attach some behavior. So we're going to define three methods on this type, one for each function. Each method needs to have the same signature as the original function. And each method should be empty at this point. Now, back in each of the old functions where you already have mountains of code, you're going to add a single line to each function that calls the equivalent method on a pointer to a value of type signal. Right? That value is a package variable. It's just a nil pointer. And since the methods are defined on that pointer, this works without ever assigning anything to it. So that's no-op number one. We created a new type with empty methods, and we updated the code to call those methods. The original comms functions are now doing two things. First, they're doing all of their actual work, and then they're calling a method which does nothing. So next, you're going to move all of the code from the old function to the new method. And that's it. That's no-op number two. So the notification is still calling the old function. The old function is forwarding that call to the new method, and the new method is doing the heavy lifting. Now, now we want to cut the middleman out of the transaction. We have this new type. We want our notify package to talk to it directly. And to do this, we need to change the notify function signatures to accept an argument which is a pointer to a value of type signal. So first, you add the parameter to the function signature. Now, this is the unsafe step. This is where the code won't compile because none of the callers are passing in the argument. So we need to update all the callers. And now the code compiles again, and everything works. The body of the function is still talking directly to the comms package. Update this to use the com argument instead. And now the original comms functions are no longer being called, and so they can be deleted. And that's no-op number three. We injected the dependency into the notify function and got the function to talk to the injected dependency. So we added all of this code, all of this indirection, in order to keep doing exactly what we were already doing. And we still can't add tests. But this is where the magic happens. In the comms package, define an interface that corresponds to the three methods on the signal type. And then in the notify package, instead of using the concrete type as, as the parameter, switch it out to use the interface type. And everything still compiles. Everything still works. And now, finally, we can implement a fake transmitter type in the notify package, defining methods that it needs in order to satisfy the transmitter interface. And these methods should be trivial. Capture whatever information you need in your tests. Verify it however you want. So three no-ops, one interface. The first no-op identified a new type, hooked it into the code. The second no-op moved all of the behavior into the methods on this type. And the third no-op eliminated the need for the original functions by getting the code to call these methods directly. And finally, defining an interface made it possible to inject fake transmitters, which made it trivially easy to capture the information necessary to make the assertions about the notifications directly. Now, the point of all of this is to make it safe to clean up and simplify the notify package so we don't get these out of sync notifications. We have all of this duplication, and we want to collapse it. 
And we can start anywhere in the Notify package. All the notifications are basically problematic in the same way. We're just going to look at one notification and only the part where we build two versions of the same notification independently of one another. So here's the text version of the resource found notification. Some person discovered some resource at some location. It's got a simple format string. It's passing in some game values representing the person, the resource, the location. And the HTML is basically doing the same thing, except there's more of everything. Right? The format string handcrafts HTML, and then the code passes in heaps of data. So to clean this up, I'm going to ignore everything that is known about good design, design patterns, design principles, because most of the time when I'm looking at legacy code, I have absolutely no idea what it should end up looking like. And I don't know what, I don't know where I'm going. It's just this kind of overwhelming mess. But even though I don't know where I'm going, I do know how to get there. And it's a process that Sandy Metz calls the flocking rules. And it's named after the incredibly complex behavior that's exhibited in nature by flocks of birds or schools of fish, where each individual is following just a handful of very simple rules, something like stay close to your neighbors, not too close, point yourself in the same direction as the ones right next to you. So the flocking rules for eliminating duplication go like this. Find the things that are the most alike. Select the smallest difference between them. And make the smallest change that will remove that difference. This is counterintuitive to a lot of people. It's tempting to focus on the sameness and then extract that and give that a name. Resist the temptation. Look for the differences. You want to encapsulate the concept that varies, not the concept that stays the same. Once you've encapsulated the differences, then the sameness either evaporates or it condenses down into something obvious. Now, the power of these rules is found in following them pedantically, meticulously, even when your gut is telling you that the change is pointless. And the beauty of the rules is in cycling through them repeatedly and discovering what emerges. So find the things that are the most alike. It's not really obvious where to start. If you have a number of choices that all seem reasonable, just, just pick one. If you have no idea where to begin, just pick something and try it. Right? You'll quickly figure out whether or not it was a useful place to start. And if it wasn't, you can just throw it away and start over. Inevitably, you'll have learned something useful, something worthwhile, something that will give you an idea of another place to try to start. So here it seems like the two format strings are a plausible choice of starting point. I'm going to collapse the data arguments for a bit just to make it easier to focus on the part that we're working on. Select the smallest difference between these two format strings. Where the plain text version has a simple formatting verb, the HTML version has a hard-coded HTML anchor tag with multiple format verbs for each. Make the smallest change that will remove that difference. If we pass the entire anchor tag as arguments to Sprintf, then the format string becomes identical in both cases, and the messy bits of HTML get extracted into new and smaller format strings. And we can collapse the identical bit into a temporary variable and then ignore it, and then repeat the flocking rules. So we're going to look at the anchor tag creation code that we just extracted. Suddenly, it seems a lot more repetitive than it did back when it was embedded in the rest of the HTML notification. There are a number of small differences. Let's start with the href. We need to make them identical. And the cleanest thing here is probably to define a URL method on the individual game types. And to be fair, we shouldn't be hand hard coding uh, URL paths all throughout the code base. So this is going to clean up a bunch of things in the rest of the code base, which is a nice bonus. And once we've done that, and we call those URL methods, things are looking considerably less noisy. And we can repeat the flocking rules. That template escaping thing is really similar. The only inconsistency is the argument that we're passing. In the first two cases, we're referencing a struct field. And in the third, we're calling a method. And there's no reason why we can't call methods everywhere. Now, we could uh, define a custom method for this, but for both of the struct fields we're referencing, they make a perfectly reasonable string representation of the type. So I'm just going to go ahead and make string methods. 
Now, a striking similarity between the three anchor tags is that each one calls URL and string on the game type that it's operating on. And the difference is just the game value itself. So these two methods make up a tiny interface. It just hasn't been defined yet. We need a name for the interface, and because we're defi sorry, defining HTML anchor tags and thinking linker, and now we can extract the creation of the anchor tag to a function that takes a linker, and this completely collapses the code for making the three HTML links into one little bit of code. So looking at the generation of the plain text version of the notification, we have that same inconsistency where we're referencing struct fields on the first two arguments, and then the string method is being called implicitly this time on the last one. And we can take those struct fields and remove them, making all of the arguments consistent. And so now the plain text version is consistent and the HTML version is consistent, but we can't collapse them into a single statement yet because there's an asymmetry between the two. So sometimes you'll know what to do next to let you collapse something, and sometimes you just need to narrow the gap a little bit by making two things a little bit less different, just a wee bit more alike. It's like treading water to give you some time to think. So here you might define a text function that takes a game value and then explicitly turns it into a string, which makes the shape of the code the same. And the goal here is that these almost identical bits of code uh, should be all the way identical so that we can collapse them into one thing. And if we could just have that one bit of code and tell it the name of the function to use to process the arguments, we'd be a lot closer to this goal. So to do that, the methods need to have the same signature. On the surface, it makes no sense for the text function to take a linker because it doesn't call URL, right? It doesn't produce links. But on the other hand, if it were to take a linker, then we could pass the functions to the formatting function that takes a function with that signature as an argument along with the stuff that we're formatting, and then we can loop through the game values, pass them to the function that we passed in before running it all through sprintf. And finally, in our notification function, those two lines of code are as close to identical as I can get them, right? And they're still not collapsible. Looking at it, though, it smells like a type, right? All of these things belong together. They deserve to be an actual thing, not a collection of kind of seemingly unrelated bits and pieces that just happen to line up. They're basically a message. Previously in the package, the notify package, the concept of a message was a nebulous thing. It existed because we were putting together strings that eventually got sent to recipients. But now a message is a real concept. It's an idea with a name. It has a template. It has game values. It's the natural home of the formatting function that we just wrote. It knows about being a plain text message or an HTML message. And then suddenly, it all collapses. The duplication is gone. At the start of it all, we had an undifferentiated mass of stringy stuff with a long, slow, careful, meticulous, painstaking slog. Clarity has emerged. Instead of a duplicative mess, we have two crisp abstractions. We have a message type, which knows how to render itself as plain text and HTML. And we have a linker interface, which allows us to represent game values agnostically in the notifications. So applying the flocking rules systematically over and over again allows you to transform code with a series of seemingly insignificant increments. The accumulation of these tiny changes brushes away the jumble that hides beautiful and simple abstractions. And it should feel like you're discovering your abstractions, not inventing them. A good abstraction feels obvious in hindsight. It's already there. It's buried in your code. It's up to you to unearth it. You don't have to know where you're going. Look for the tiny differences, eliminate them, and then name what's left. Thank you. <laughs> Do you run into situations where there are too many types, layers of indirection after applying the flocking rules? Does it get harder to understand how your program works from the top to the bottom? Uh, so the answer is no. Um, I run into, when people don't use the flocking rules, I run into problems that are exactly that. You get an explosion of names and fragments of ideas so people are, they've extracted too many layers, too many little functions, and none of the functions fit together into a big coherent idea. But with the flocking rules, what you'll often find is that you, you're peeling away 
um, one of the things that I often do to start working on uh, refactoring is inline everything. So especially, so, I mean, in, in, in Go it helps as well, but I, I work in other world languages as well, where people have been socially pushed towards making very, very small methods without an understanding of um, what it is they're naming. So you get these like shards of ideas. It's like someone broke a vase and now you're, you know, your ideas spread all throughout the code base and there's no way to put the whole thing inside your head. And so what I do is I just keep inlining everything until it's just one massive, you know, it's like, oh, this endpoint is 12 lines of code. No, it's not. It's 1,200 lines of code. It was just spread out everywhere. So I pull it all in. And then very, very slowly, you start finding the things that are, have, they're very, very similar. So they're clearly related in some way. And you start making the differences go away. So sometimes the differences are completely, um, they're stupid, they're insignificant. It's really just the same thing, but you wrote it, you know, one was on a Tuesday and the other one was on a Saturday and they, they happen to look different. So now you're making things look more alike, which means that you're starting to recognize the ideas that are really truly there and the differences that are actually meaningful. And so you start seeing things that were named the same, but they're not the same idea. Now you have puns in your code base and it makes it way harder to understand. So you can decide that no, when we say this one thing, it means this thing. When we say this other thing, like we have to give it a different name. Otherwise, oh, we're all gonna be in trouble. So I found that, that with the flocking rules, I'm forced to uh, make a very careful distinction between meaningful differences and um, incidental differences and remove them one layer at a time until I'm left with something that is actually meaningful. And what you'll also find uh, very often is that you'll have, um, you know, it's, it started off with 12 lines of code, you inline it, now you have 1,200 lines of code. Basically, it's all one big conditional that's nested with, you know, conditionals and your conditionals all the way down. And you find um, that you, the, the next step then is to try to make all of the conditionals explicit. So you have this enormous conditional and, and pull it all up so that you have, well, if it's this and this, but not that and the other thing, but also definitely not this other thing, um, suddenly you start uh, seeing that you really truly have only 27 paths through your code base because the other five that you d defined, turns out they're all dead, so you can delete them. And then slowly uh, through, through finding all of this, like exposing all of this complexity and putting it right in front of you, you uh, start discovering what's actually there. That was a great question, thank you. Thank you.